operation, except you had to sign that statement of any. Sweet cat! I'm flying up in. A very serious operation, except you had to sign that statement of any. The kid dies. <laughs> now how they do that? <laughs> Make you feel good about bringing them in. And uh, the doctors in all cases had a, I can recall in my own youth, the terror of watching that ether mask go over my face. I didn't mind the operation, but when I saw that big black mask coming in, I'd smother me. And so the uh, doctors and I talked about that, and they said, well, it's a, it's a light plastic mask now, and we'll let you put it over their mouths. And uh, of course, you have to be very cheery with the kids And I recall the first time I did that, the kid's eyes, as he realized what was happening, looked at me and his eyes said, you traitor. <laughs> <laughs> you evil man. And I walked out of there completely shaken, because the kid had just, I said, well, it's nothing going to happen. I'm just going to put you on the table and I'm going to do this and that. And all of a sudden, I have to reach with my hand and put this plastic mask over the kid's eyes. The, the eyes have a way of saying things to me. And, and, and that, uh, that film clip is a study in eyes as well. The trust and the innocence and the courage of those young men, as opposed to the fear in Eisenhower itself that it wasn't going to work. And that even though it wasn't going to work, he was going to lose seven out of ten of them. And yet the speech had to be heroic. The speech had to be calm. The speech had to be, well, don't worry. Uh, and yet inside was this inner turmoil to <laughs> get the chance to see later uh, when the uh, adjutant comes and says, uh, it wasn't 70%, it was only 20 And you see in Selleck's face uh, that he understands that even 20 is too much. There's another extraordinary moment earlier in the film uh, which ties us to this uh, book here and to uh, one of the most puzzling things in human uh, nature and in war. When uh, Churchill uh, calls Eisenhower in, Churchill's idea is that the uh, British Air Force and the American Air Force will win the war by bombing every city in which there is a German soldier. And Eisenhower's response is, I am not a military person to preside over the destruction of cities and all that they represent. Think of that as opposed to what we did in Iraq and Desert Storm. We now think that the city is the place to go. And Eisenhower decides that it's going to be the youth of America on the beaches that are going to liberate Europe so that cities will not be destroyed. And, and there is this very peculiar sense of reverence for the city, uh, which is uh, behind it. The city for Aristotle, uh, who comes after Homer, is a natural outgrowth of being human in the same way that a nest is a natural outgrowth of being a bird. Aristotle didn't think of cities as artificial. He thought of them as organic because they then become the womb in which future generations develop. So to destroy a city, and this is a book about the destruction of a city, the destruction of Troy, was a horrible act in the same way that going and smashing a bird's nest with eggs in it would be a horrible act. That's because a, a, a city is a womb in which a culture uh, the way in which we protect each other is through culture, uh, is, uh, is uh, in the course of nurturing future generations. And we have some sense in the, in the craziness of the Arab extremists that they knew that what they wanted to destroy was something key in New York City and in Washington. If, if you can get to the city, uh, we have withdrawn from two holy uh, Islamic cities in Iran because we know that if we were to destroy those cities, cities that are holy to Islam, we would, even the army knows, we would turn the whole of the Islamic world against us. 
So that's another key to the Iliad, the destruction of cities. And, and, and uh, I have no reason not to think that it's not historically accurate. Eisenhower says it's better to lose our best and brightest on the beaches to rest Hitler, uh, to rest Europe from Hitler than it is to bomb all of the cities in which there are German soldiers. That's a very hard choice, and it's the choice that we are now not making. Our sense is, for God's sake, protect American boys and use these terrible bombs to go in and make uh, mishmash of the cities because you can always rebuild the city. I'm not so sure. Uh, Augustine's great work is called The City of God. Cities are not just something extraneous. Anyway, uh, we're going to have a beautiful uh, treat here this morning because uh, Sister Andre has agreed to say a few words about and read a, a beautiful meditation uh, she uh, wrote on the uh, death of her father. Mm -hmm. You've heard so much about this coming up, so you <laughs> I wrote this because I wanted to, because it gnawed me for many years, and finally I wanted, I didn't want to buy Easter cards this year, so I sent this as my Easter card to my brothers and sisters. And I think I'm supposed to read this, because I think in the, in the essay itself, there is death, Mortality. Did you hear all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the Greek values are in all of us, and they are in me too. And that's what's here. I called it Death Was a Welcome Visitor. There were 13 of us, Pa, Ma, and their precious 11, as they called us. We were poor, maybe not the poorest people in the parish but we were poor. We six girls didn't get new hats every Easter, and the five boys didn't get a monthly salary for running the farm. But we ate three square meals a day, and in between times when we felt like it. Pa and Ma put two dollars in the collection box in church every Sunday, 20 or 25 on Easter and Christmas. We were a family, and as a family, we sure prayed a lot. We all sat on benches around the big linoleum-covered kitchen table and prayed out loud before and after meals. About 15 minutes worth of morning prayers were tacked on to our after-breakfast prayers. Our night prayers were, the church, were like church devotions, candles and a statue and everybody kneeling there, praying on and on until you felt like it was one of those holy hours we had in our church on First Friday. It seemed natural for us to talk about death. We often did. We had a picture on, on our living room wall of a young, good-looking nun in a coffin. She was Pa's oldest sister. He told us she died a couple of months after she got the black veil, and he never saw her after she left home. The picture hung there a year in and year out, and Pa would tell us kids, no sense being scared of death. Only thing that matters is how death finds you. Pa was in his middle 50s when he first got sick. He and Imelda, his 11th child, had rheumatic fever at the same time. Imelda had some trouble with it. Pa never got over it. By the time he was in his early 60s, he had a weak heart and a lot of arthritic pains. He got, it, he got so he had to use all four limbs just to move around in the house. Every move gave him so much pain he'd break out in a cold sweat. It didn't seem right that we could all be so healthy and our pa was so full of pain. Between moves, he looked at the picture on the wall and prayed his rosary. Then, when Anthony got back from Korea and Andrew from Germany, he sort of gave up. One Friday afternoon in late April, Ma and the boys took him to the hospital. The doctor had said it was for a checkup. The next morning, the priest brought him communion, a 
about 10 minutes later, the doctor came and looked him over. He told us Pa was saying his beats. The doctor was just going out of the room when Pa called him back. By the time the doctor got to the bed, death had found Pa. You never seen anything like it, like our family when we came into that room. I walked up to the bed and pulled the sheet away from Pa's face. He looked young with the pain and lines around his mouth and his eyes gone. His whole body was so wonderfully, peacefully quiet at last. And I broke out, I broke our odd, stunned silence when I said, it looks like he made it. Mom put her hand on Pa's forehead and choked, Papa, I wanted you so much, but I don't want you back. Then I took the rosary out of Pa's still warm hands and gave it to Ma and she kissed it. Paul took the Pa's watch off his wrist and gave it to Joanne. She put it to her ear and said, it's still running. Then we all knelt down like it was in our living room and started to pray the rosary. When we said, eternal rest, grant Pa, O oh Lord, Elbert said, hell, you got it made, Pa, that's for sure. <laughs> Look, Ma, Andrew said, he's wearing his scapular and it's Saturday. Ma said, he always wore it. And we went on with the rosary. When we finished the rosary, Ma kissed Pa on the forehead again. Then we picked up Pa's suit, his shoes, and his hat, and went back to the farm. It felt strange just to leave him there alone. We were the happiest folks at the wake, Ma and 10 of her precious 11. Marianne is a poor Claire, and she couldn't get out for Pa's funeral. But my Benedictine sister and I made it. I never thought it would be like this at a family wake. Pa in his casket was in the living room. Ma went around like she was a hostess at a celebration in Pa's honor. She made everybody sit down at the table and eat something the neighbors had brought over. Every hour she'd come to one of us and say, now you lead the rosary for Pa. We kids went about feeling proud and victorious like it was Easter and we had a right to celebrate. It was as if we had to sing Alleluia, Pa's out of pain. He made it, Alleluia. <laughs> the last day somebody went to Lawrence and said, your Ma sure takes it good. Lawrence looked at Ma sitting at the casket and said, why shouldn't she? Pa was ready. The last night a lot of nuns came to the wake. Pa got, Ma got, co got them coffee and some good molasses cookies that Izzy Benfield had brought over. One of the nuns said, you people take this so bravely. And Ma said, Albert was ready. I told the children, we'll be terribly lonesome. Anella was making coffee in the kitchen. We could hear her laugh in the living room where we nuns and Ma were sitting. Then Ma said, Papa can do more for us now that he, than he ever could. She looked towards the kitchen and said, he's helping already. Anella laughed again. That one, Ma said, has been mixed up for two years now. Papa will help her find a nice Catholic man. <laughs> that's, that's his first job. <laughs> one of the nuns, her stomach large with liver cancer, took, took Anthony aside and asked if she could be with Pa alone for a minute. Pa, Anthony said, sure, and moved everybody into the kitchen and the bathroom. After a little while, the nun announced, I'm not afraid to die anymore. I talked to Albert and I'm not scared anymore. Everybody thought we could would break down at the funeral when the priest said in his sermon, we've buried a lot of good men here in the past two years, but today we are burying the best of them. We knew he was telling the truth. Out in the cemetery, we stood around the grave, Ma and her 10 of her children. We two nuns sang with the choir the rest followed the prayers in their booklets. After the service, the relatives and neighbors filled out, filled the church basement for lunch. Ma took Imelda and Sister Jamana and me with her, and we went out to the kitchen to see if there was enough to eat. She asked about the potatoes and the meat. One of the cooks said, now Nettie, you sit down. You've had a hard day. I thought Ma looked a little tired. Then Ma said, today is Papa's day. 
Like my poor player said, it's Papa's birthday into heaven. Elbert and Lawrence came to the kitchen. Ma, they said, let's eat. With a tall, strapping son on either side of her, our little Ma walked into the dining room. Andrew asked Father to pray grace, and we all sat down for lunch. That's a disguised uh, version of the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad is about the same uh, power of uh, death to end a life and about the need for uh, food at the moment of death in those who survive and about the love we saw yesterday of Andromache for Hector and her fear that uh, he would, if he kept up in the battle, uh, deny uh, herself and her son uh, of a peaceful life afterwards. <laughs> and we want to uh, look a little bit at that now. The Iliad does not have the sense of serenity and the sense of faith that uh, is evident in the story that Sister Andre told. Uh, but there is nonetheless uh, an extraordinary insight into human nature uh, which emerges from the Iliad that makes it almost an essential of um, the educative uh, process. I was telling somebody yesterday that one of the great sadnesses uh, of uh, life as it exists now <coughs> academically, that uh, this is a good college. And yet, I don't think there are 10% of our graduates who leave this college having read the Iliad and the Odyssey. At the other college here in town, my guess is that it's about 2% or 3% if they're lucky. And, uh, and you wonder why uh, would an academic institution, which uh, is uh, in a force and in strength to bring young people the best that the past has produced, would have gotten to the point that they now ignore uh, works as powerful as this. In, in my own classes and little surveys that I have uh, done over the past couple of years, I think three of 200 students uh, have been exposed to the Iliad or the Odyssey either <coughs> in high school or in college. Sister Lois used to teach it in eighth grade. So um, th there's something uh, puzzling going on. Jefferson and Madison read the Iliad in Greek. Mm -hmm. And it gradually has disappeared from the American school curriculum. As a matter of fact, in textbooks on education, and people who like these works are kind of made fun of, or called essentialists. An essentialist is a person who dares to believe that in base all human beings are the same. <laughs> That's made fun of. Uh, the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey gradually disappeared. They were not a part of um, university education, even in the Ivy Leagues, in a significant way in the 20th century. And in the 1940s, uh, Mark Van Doren, whom I mentioned earlier, and a guy by the name of Robert Hutchins, and another guy by the name of Stringfellow Carr, decided to reintroduce them into the undergraduate curriculum in a movement called the Great Books Program. And uh, we have records of the faculty meetings at Columbia where they decided to do this, and the uh, majority of the professors said it'll never work with undergraduates. They couldn't possibly understand either of those two books. Maybe if you were working with PhDs, you could do it, but don't give it to undergraduates. And there's a very famous uh, speech where Van Doren stood up and said uh, what Sister Andre has presented to us today. They know family, they know anger, they know jealousy, they've been exposed to death. 
That's all the Iliad and the Odyssey are all about. What are you saying only PhDs can understand? And the revolution that started there spread to colleges throughout the United States. It's uh, gradually uh, disappearing again, so we're ready for a new wave of people. So go out to your local school boards and say, hey, why do you throw away the best? Let's look at death and let's look at it with uh, Simone Bay. Let's go to uh, Simone Bay. This is extraordinary. Uh, I have um, I have severely cut. This is not a complete paragraph of the Iliad. Uh, all the force. Uh, it's a um, just a collection of uh, sentences, and, um, and, and and they give some sense, I think, of the incredible richness in this 20 or 30 page essay. By the way. Uh, for a number of years, until about three years ago, the only way you could get this essay in the United States was by applying to the Quakers. The Quakers at Pendle Hill in Pennsylvania published this essay on their own because they thought it was so important that people understand that the Iliad is not in praise of war. Uh, it is a poem which says, think twice before you go to war. And, and, and there's a little print shop in Pendle Hill. You can still get it on the internet. If you go to Amazon.com and type in Pendle Hill and Simone Bay, and you'll come up. And I think it, it used to sell for 50 cents. Mm -hmm. Now a couple of other publishers have gotten on it. They say, this is a good thing. Let's sell it for $3 or 30 One might possibly cite a few other names of great works, but nothing the peoples of Europe have produced matches their first known poem. So when you're reading the Iliad, you're looking at the childhood of poetry. You're present at the birth. We talk about the nativity of Christ having something to tell us about what Christianity is all about. The Iliad in its own way is the birth of all of the sophistication that uh, we now uh, put into our poetry. The people of Europe will perhaps, we hope, rediscover epic genius when they learn the following three things. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm translating it a little bit different, but I'm not going to get too much. <coughs> Number one, never to admire force. Number two, never to hate the enemy. Number three, never to scorn the unfortunate. So Simone Bay's three keys to the Iliad are the first poem that the human being in Europe produced had the following insights. The force won't work. Your enemy shouldn't be hated. And the unfortunate should not be put aside. That's extraordinary. Why then do we only have 10% or less reading this? They will perhaps rediscover epic genius when they learn never to admire force, not to hate the enemy, nor to scorn the unfortunate. And she says, it is doubtful whether this will soon occur. Now she's going to define why she thinks it's important that we not admire force. How many times have you heard, America is the most powerful nation the world has produced? Mm -hmm. Our military power is second to none. You think people are going to admire us because they're afraid of us? And we've got a Statue of Liberty which stands as extraordinary symbol to the world, which says, <coughs> welcome all you who are unfortunate. Why don't we use all that money worldwide? to say, uh, those who are unfortunate, we have help for you. Here's why force, this is Simone Bay. Force is as pitiless to the person who possesses it, or thinks he does, as it is to its victims. Force is as pitiless to the person who possesses it, or thinks he does, as it is to its victims. The person who applies force not only kills the individual at whom he aims the force, but also himself. You know, the, the greatest, the greatest uh, power of the Odyssey, if I could just stop for just a second, is that it says it takes a long time to come home 
Attica War. The battle at Troy took ten years. And then it took Odysseus ten years to get back home. We have next door to us a Vietnam vet who is not home yet. I have taught classes. I've had a, entire classes of Vietnam vets. He can't come home yet. It takes incredible understanding. Uh, this beautiful man who lives next door to me lives in a house that was left in by his aunt. He's incapable of work. And every night when the McNeil Lehrer Report shows the pictures of these young guys who have died, he takes a wine bottle and puts a carnation in it and puts it on his front door. <coughs> That's about the only encounter he can make with life. I have a colleague at uh, St. Cloud State who spends his entire life in this town just looking for people who haven't made it home yet from Vietnam. And the same also happened in Desert Storm, and it's going to happen in Iraq. So, the, honestly, it takes a long time to come home after a war. Force is as pitiless to the man who possesses it, or thinks he does, as it is to its victims. The victims are crushed by force, the person applying it is intoxicated with it. The truth is, nobody is power or force. Nobody possesses it. The human race is not divided up in the Iliad into conquered persons, slaves, suppliant on the one hand and conquerors on chiefs on the other. It's hard to tell when you read the Iliad whether Homer loves the Trojans more than the Greeks or the Greeks more than the Trojans. He sees both of them as caught in a terrible, terrible conflict that's beyond their control. And the best man that he finds is among the Trojans, Hector. And it looks in the Iliad when you first read it that, that there are people who kill other people and um, uh, looks like that's divided up into those who win and those who lose. It says if you read it carefully, there are no winners and there are no losers. People are just caught up in force which destroys them both. In this poem, there is not a single person who does not at one time or another have to bow his neck to force. It's infinitely better on the moment of death never to have looked back and seen that you have squashed another person. There's a wonderful proverb, the good die easily. Those who have spent their lifetime crushing others don't. The true hero, the true subject, the center of the Iliad is force. So the Iliad is not a story of the Trojan War. This film is all off, all off. Jackson's is a great big film. Mm -hmm. But the true subject of the Iliad is, is something invisible. It's that you never want to get into a position where you're forcing another person to do something. Because that destroys you or destroys them. You don't want to crush another individual. Force as man's instrument, force as man's master. Once you taste the poison,